thank you everybody for taking having uh, taking time and being here this morning. Um, under the circumstances, I think that the most appropriate way that uh, we'll operate this morning is we will all we will all stay uh, masked uh, throughout the space unless uh, you uh, speak. Then you would, and then as soon as you're finished, if you would mask back up, I think we'll be able to uh, operate uh, uh, safely in that manner. <clears throat> So uh, I'd like to call the meeting of August 14, 2020 to order for the Board of Regents. Please call roll. Here. I'm not sure you're on. I'm not sure you're on. Regent Hawks here. We're not hearing when Jim leaned into the mic, which is even clearly when he backed away, we could not. Regent Hawks? Here. You could see the. He said, said yes. Okay, sorry. Regent Kenny? Here. Regent O'Connor? Here. Regent Ferris? Here. Regent Pillen? Here. Regent Schaefer? Here. Regent Weitz? Here. A quorum is present. Thank you. In your materials, you have a copy of the minutes from the meeting on June 26, 2020. I'd entertain a motion for approval. So moved. What's the task? Is there a second? Second. Uh, are there any comments on the minutes or corrections? Hearing none, please call roll. Regent Miller? Here. Regent Moore? Yes. Regent Schroeder? Yes. Regent Beal? Yes. Regent Hawks? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. <clears throat> Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Weitz? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. The motion is passed. Thank you. In compliance with the Nebraska Open Meetings Act, the board has posted a copy of the act near the welcome table at the top of the stairs behind you. Um, we'll move into kudos. Kudos is a uh, long-standing tradition within the Board of Regents, uh, a very, very special way to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all the public servants of the University of Nebraska staff and uh, for the extraordinary work that they do. Um, we uh, unfortunately uh, aren't able to have our kudos recipients uh, attend in person. However, uh, we certainly can continue uh, to uh, honor the longstanding tradition. Uh, so uh, we will have our first kudos recipient uh, uh, virtually, and uh, our first kudos recipient is Amy Byersdorf from the University of Nebraska Medal Medical Center. And the award will be presented by Regent O'Connor. Regent O'Connor. Um, I think you, uh, you can stay seated. I think you can do it from your table. On behalf of the Board of Regents, I am pleased to present a kudos award to Amy Byersdorf, a physical therapist in UNMC's Monroe Meyer Institute. As the leader of MMI's outpatient services, Amy and her team have worked tirelessly during the pandemic to execute telehealth, navigate a changing landscape of reimbursement and compliance, and above all, offer quality care. However, Amy's been a leader and innovator since earning her master's degree in physical therapy at UNMC more than 25 years ago. Colleagues cite her collaborations with UNL engineering students to design and build one-of-a-kind products for the unique challenges of MMI patients, such as an, ad an adaptive, customized scooter designed for a child without arms. This partnership continues as engineering students from both the Omaha and Lincoln campuses collaborate on MMI's Go Baby Go adapted car programs for toddlers with movement challenges. Amy also leads the way with MMI's unique pedals program, which teaches children with movement disorders how to ride a bike with the launch of MMI's special needs car seat program and other initiatives. 
Said one colleague, Amy rises to the occasion at every opportunity. Amy's fluency in Spanish has strengthened her relationship with Spanish-speaking families receiving early intervention services at Omaha Public Schools and MMI and has made her a critical provider to community-based clinical partners such as One World. I have seen parents hug Amy with extreme gratitude for the impact she has made in their child's life, one nominator said. Recently, Amy combined her love of children and animals and began training her beloved lab, Brody, to be a therapy dog. Please join me in thanking Amy for her dedicated service to UNMC, the Monroe Meyer Institute, and the community. Congratulations, Amy, and thank you, Regent O'Connor. Uh, Regent Kenny will present the Kudos Award to Kristen Case from the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Regent Kenny. Good morning. The Board of Regents is pleased to present the Kudos Award to Kristen Case, Community Liaison for the Service Learning Academy of the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Kristen goes above and beyond to bring the metropolitan mission to life to Omaha, UNO. Realizing it's something that takes time and patience, she works tirelessly to create authentic partnerships between UNO faculty and the community organizations. Last year, she worked on approximately 125 community organizations to develop 208 service learning courses at UNO. This is a record number of service learning courses offered at UNO and simply would not have been possible without Kristen's work. Kristen co-teaches and mentors students in multiple programs at UNO. Through her own creativity and strong community relationships, Kristen has created a rigorous curriculum that connects students with internship opportunities that are meaningful and in some cases life-changing. Kristen is not only dedicated to UNO students, also serves her colleagues in the UNO campus in significant ways. She's a member of the Staff Advisory Council and one of the first cohorts and trainers of the Microaggressions Training Group. Kristen also worked with the service learning team to provide strong, implicit bias and equity work. More recently, she has accepted the opportunity to serve in the first lead diversity cohorts for individuals interested in examining, addressing diversity, inclusion, and equity in their work. Outside UNO, Kristen recently was named the first ever female board chairman of Omaha Home for Boys which serves as a mentor for young leaders and trainer for the nonprofit Association of the Midlands. Please join me in thanking Kristen for commitment to the community and UNO. Congratulations, Kristen. I love the sign, the people. Uh, and thank you, Regent Kenny. Jim, I don't think you're on. <clears throat> Testing. Charles? <clears throat> next, is, next is Thomas McCargill from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln uh, is our next recipient, and Regent Miller will make the presentation. Regent Miller. The Board of Regents is pleased to present a kudos award to Thomas McCargill, Agricultural Research Technician in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Tom began his service to UNL in 1988 and has had a profound effect on the research program in swine nutrition and molecular genetics. According to Philip Miller, professor of animal science, vigilant observations of animal behavior and health are paramount to conducting successful feeding studies. And Tom's ability and willingness to help others and put in the extra effort is noteworthy. Because Tom lives at the University Swine Research Unit, he handles all weather-related emergencies, including snow removal, power outages, and wind damage <clears throat> to buildings, as well as general unit surveillance. Tom routinely takes time away from his duties to assist other employees, which is especially helpful when technicians and students from Lincoln are at the unit collecting data. Jeff Perkins, Swine Unit Manager, writes, Tom is an enthusiastic employee who looks to achieve accurate information and data collection for the research projects and works with fellow coworkers to ensure that protocols are being followed and accurate data is being recorded. 
Dr. Roger Johnson, Professor Emeriti in the Department of Animal Science, recalls hiring Tom as a research technician and watching him grow and develop into one of the department's most trusted and reliable employees. Much of the research in genetics and physiology of reproduction requires daily observation. Tom has become the resident expert in ensuring those measurements are done daily and recorded exactly according to protocol. His good work continues to support new and ongoing ideas and experiments. Other coworkers, faculty, and former supervisors have noted that if you need a get it done and done right person, Tom is the man to get on the job. He has become an essential member of the Swine Production and Research Group. Last winter, when the Swine Unit was staffed at 30%, Tom put in a lot of extra hours to keep the unit running and maintain exceptional animal care. When the farm manager was absent, Tom stepped up and ensured the farm kept working at peak efficiency. Tom has always been a team player, finding the most efficient ways to accomplish any task at hand. Matthew Anderson, Ag Research Technician for the Animal Science Swine Unit and former Swine Unit Manager, put it best, we could sure use many more employees like Tom. Please join me in thanking Thomas McCargill for his dedication to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Congratulations, <clears throat> Thomas, and thank you for all your work. Uh, Sharon Kofed from the University of Nebraska at Kearney is our next recipient, and her award will be presented uh, by Regent Veal. On behalf of the Board of Regents, it is my pleasure to recognize Sharon Kofed, Library Curriculum Associate at UNK's C.T. Ryan Library. Born and raised in Omaha, Sharon came to UNK in 2001 on a Regent Scholarship. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Speech Communication and her Master of Arts in English with emphasis in Literature. While earning her degrees, Sharon was employed as a student worker in the same library she's worked in since 2010. <clears throat> Sharon's responsibilities involve working with patrons to find necessary resources, stewardship of various collections housed within the curriculum department, including collection development and publisher contacts, maintaining online themed lists of materials for use by the UNK community and organizations across the country, and providing general assistance to the university community. Colleagues describe Sharon as dedicated, innovative, upbeat, and always willing to lend a hand. She enjoys going above and beyond. For example, Sharon instituted story time at UNK's Child Development Center, where she assists in the selection of books to read to the children, and then curates selections of similarly themed books for later enjoyment. When COVID-19 interrupted normal procedures, Sharon responded by providing story time via Zoom. And when Paj University came to campus, Sharon oversaw library hour reading games and puzzles center and instituted challenges that kept interest high. Beyond her library responsibility, Sharon serves on reader committees for the Nebraska Golden Sower Award, is a volunteer teacher at her church, is the primary caregiver for her mother, and uses her skills as a seamstress and crafter to make items to help those in need, such as scars, for the Special Olympics. Sharon is a recipient of the UNK Employee Achievement Award and was a member of the library staff chosen for the Teamwork Excellence Award. For her consistently exceptional contributions to the university, we're proud to honor her today with the Board of Regents Kudos Award. Congratulations, Sharon. Um, our next and final uh, recipient is a team of recipients, and if all of us think about how our life has changed in the last 150 days, and if uh, it wouldn't have been for wouldn't be for technology folks, uh, we would have been uh, really derailed. Uh, we've just simply been disrupted briefly. And so uh, the uh, NU technology team of Matt Bolton, Corey Savela, Christopher Wolverton, Christy Kennedy, Charles Swinseth, and Nick Phillippe, all members of the NU IT uh, technology team are the recipients of a Team Kudos Award. Uh, this award will be presented by Regent Clare. Regent Clare. Thank you, Regent Pillen. It's uh, my privilege to, uh, to present this award on behalf of the Board of Regents. Uh, Kudos Team Award to the following NUITS employees, as read by Regent Pillen earlier. 
Matt, Matt Bolton, Christy Kennedy, Charles Swentha, Swentheth, Nick Phillippe, Corey Svela, and Christopher Wolverton. As the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic prompted closures and other measures to protect employees and the public at public meetings, the Board of Regents found, it, found itself having to reinvent the wheel in order to find the right balance between safety and the public's right to participate in the meetings of its elected Board of Regents. As the world has had to adapt to an exponential increase in remote meetings and conferences over the last five months, the use of video conferencing technology, such as Zoom, has exploded, including at the University of Nebraska. Therefore, it seemed logical that Zoom would be used to address the Board of Regents' remote meeting needs. That said, a Board of Regents meeting is no ordinary Zoom call. This team of NU ITS employees found ways to provide cybersecurity for our meetings, coordinate the integration public commenters and kudos recipients into the meeting at the right juncture, make sure the speakers and the board, of, board members' video squares were streamed onto one page, and get the mics muted and unmuted on cue. It was a delicate dance of detail management, and the NU ITS team's performance was superb. And it probably goes without saying, it was all done with an air of genuine service to the board, a sense of commitment to the university, and a fair share of good-spirited humor when needed during stressful times. Too often, the person scrambling behind the scenes, managing the copious details unknown to those outside the scramble, go unnoticed and unthanked. Please join me on behalf of the Board of Regents in thanking this team of NU ITS employees for their exceptional service to the University of Nebraska and the, and the public in the state of Nebraska providing that feed. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Regent Clare. Uh, next will be uh, uh, next will be uh, I'll introduce President Carter uh, to go over the five year his five year strategy plan. Before I do that, there'd be uh, two things I'd like to. Uh, uh, one would be for our colleagues that if uh, all of you, uh, I will ask each of you if if you would like give you the opportunity to make a few comments after President Carter uh, presents this strategy. Uh, the other, uh, you know, this is a big deal. I would, I would ask if we could all make sure our phones are turned off, our laptops are turned down, uh, that we stay zeroed in and focused on the next 25 minutes. It's our future, it's critical. Uh, so with that, uh, President Carter, I know from day one, uh, you and your team started zeroing in and focusing on the future. Um, everybody is, uh, and, uh, and some of the things have changed, but the, the, the horizons still stay in the same. Um, we are really, really excited about uh, this work, and we're really excited to hear from you this morning. So, President Carter. Good morning, everyone, and uh, Regent Pillen, thank you uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, let me say right up front, first and foremost, it's a great day to be in Nebraska, and it's a great day to be a Nebraskan. I am really proud to be part of this team that has collaboratively over the last seven months put together a five-year strategy that has a bias for action. Before I get to the what, I want to say a few words about the why, the context in which we're having this discussion about the future of the University of Nebraska and our state. This is a critical moment, not just here in Nebraska, but across our entire nation and quite honestly, the world. This was true before 2020, before COVID, before all the economic and social pain that it has caused, before we have been confronted with painful questions about equality and justice. But it's even more true now. The pandemic has required us to think differently about everything. Course delivery, the way our employees do their work, all the things that we traditionally associate with university life. Study abroad, musical performances, dormitory life, commencements, and as we have been reminded this week, yes, athletics. 
But I want to tell you this document stays true to a couple principles. First and foremost, who we are as Nebraskans. We're hardworking, we're sincere, we're authentic. We are unapologetic about who we are. We do things with class, with dignity and respect. And this document speaks to our love of our students. In fact, as you will see through this document, we focus primarily on our students because they are the future of our state and our nation and our world. And that same commitment to our students <clears throat> guided our decision to reopen our campuses for the fall. There are those out there that may say, if there are not athletics on the field and in the arenas this fall, why would we have students on our campus? As campuses across the nation have gone to online only, we have been planning throughout the entire summer with the guidance of our experts at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and the amazing work that's happened on each campus to make sure that we are safe, that we are de-densifying. And it's no mistake that we're right here in person at the Innovation Campus to show that we're ready to do this. I just can't say enough about how proud I am of the faculty, the staff, and the leadership at the chancellor level to be able to ready to open our campus and start in-person education. Uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln will start remote education next Monday for one week, and then all 51,000 students across our four main campuses to include our campus in Curtis and our technical agricultural school will be in person starting 24 August. And we will make sure that we're safe and that we have blended, blended accommodations for all. We're not making everybody come to campus. We'll have mirror opportunities to still offer online education, to take care of those with health needs that don't feel safe to be in person for this critical time. And this strategy will speak to how we do things the right way and looking forward. So this is a moment of challenge. The question becomes, how will we respond? The institutions that will succeed will be the ones that are flexible, adapt to do things differently. The University of Nebraska is going to be among them. The value of higher education is more clear now than ever. The future will be all about how we provide new and creative pathways, to provide that education and all the benefits it accrues to the people of our state. And it is in this context that we set about creating a five-year plan for growth and success of our university, a plan to define who we are, what we are going to become, and how we're going to get there. Now, as you are sitting there at your table, and you will notice online today on our University of Nebraska website, there is actually a document. It's a physical, physical, readable document. It's very simple, and it's intended for everyone to read. This is a dynamic document. It's written with the idea that it is living and breathing and can change and be flexible as we go forward. And it has a bias for action so that we can get things done as Nebraskans. Before I get into the details, I do want to thank the 28 member team of faculty, staff, and students that helped guide this, this process. Their names are in the back of the five-year strategy plan. This was a diverse team representing all campuses and their ideas helped get us to a stronger and better product. I'm also grateful to the alumni, the business, the ag leaders, the elected leaders, and others for sharing their input. So I'm pleased to be able to present to it, this to you today. The plan is all about providing hope, trust, predictability, and positive outcomes for the people of Nebraska. And before I get into the details, if you were just to say, what does this plan do? Very simply, it's about growing our student body, it's about making them successful. It's about affordability, accessibility for all. It's about hearing all voices. And ultimately, it's about providing a bigger and stronger workforce for the state of Nebraska. A state that is two years older than our 151-year-old university as a land-grant system university. A state where 90% of our land mass is dedicated to agriculture and ranching a state that feeds not only Nebraska, our country, but the world. So yes, this strategy has state, national, and global impact. So let's dive a little bit into the details. When we began our strategy development work, I challenged the presidential transition team to articulate a vision. 
a desired future state for the university which is showing on the screens now. If I were to pick out the operative words in there, I would highlight affordable, accessible, world-class education. I would also highlight where we intend to be leaders and some of the things that we already do. These are the 21st century challenges, water and food security, infectious disease, rural community vitality, national and cybersecurity, and early childhood education. These are just some of the elements that we do, will continue to do and be world leaders. The University of Nebraska was founded on the principle that higher education should be accessible to all. That principle is as important today as it was more than 150 years ago, where the college degree increasingly recognized as a vital pathway to individual and economic prosperity. Cost was not be a barrier for any qualified Nebraskan student or any out-of-state students to attend the university. And it's intentional that this broad theme comes first in our strategy. Strategies in this area include, as you have seen us launch since April 17th, Nebraska Promise a tuition-free education for families with an annual income less than $60,000. As you know, Nebraska Promise was successfully launched, as I just said, in April, and we will invest pilot funds in student support services so that not only do we get these students in our front door, but we will make them successful on our campuses to ensure these students stay on pace for degree completion. Evaluating all university-imposed costs for students and limiting increases to the greatest extent possible. Yes, we're in an economic crisis, and yes, our behavior in the past would initially be to increase tuition rates, but that's not what we've done in this case. We have not passed on our economic losses to our students. We have frozen tuition for fiscal years 21-22 and 22-23, and we've even decreased our online tuition rates. We'll continue to invest in efforts like open education resources, OERs, which create free or low-cost digital course materials and save our students money. We are adopting a true four-year undergraduate graduation guarantee. This is not just getting to a higher graduation rate. This is about putting our money where our mouth is. When the Board of Regents adopted the 120-hour undergraduate degree cap in 2011, degree plans were developed to guide students to four-year graduation. Under this new concept, if a student follows their four-year degree plan and an administrative barrier of any kind, such as course scheduling, stands in the way, the university will cover the cost of tuition beyond year four. We're shifting the university's undergraduate tuition model from a per credit for cost to block basis. Shifting to a block credit model allows a student to complete 12 to 18 credit hours at the same block rate. Block tuition has become a higher educational standard and incentivizes 15 to 18 credit semesters leading to an on-time or early graduation. And finally, in collaboration with Governor Ricketts and the K-12 Commissioner, Matt Bloomstead, I intend to re-engage the Nebraska P-16 initiative, bringing together partners from K-12, the university, state colleges, private and independent colleges, and supporting entities to implement strategies to reach our statewide higher education attainment goal. We'll work to strengthen pathways to include transfers from community colleges, other colleges, as well as adult learners to maximize accessibility to a University of Nebraska education, including ease of transfer between modality, between online and on-campus and institutions. Now, as I said, Nebraska's workforce needs are urgent and growing. Our state will have more than 34,000 annual openings in high-skill, high-demand, high-wage, sometimes known as H3, jobs in the years ahead. And the needs exist across the state. Demand for more engineers, internet technology professionals, nurses, teachers, physician assistants, and other professionals is acute. And of course, the university will lead in supporting the backbone of Nebraska's workforce and economy, agriculture, by educating the next generation of farmers, ranchers, scientists, and others who will help feed a growing world. We're excited to award the Nebraska Career Scholarship introduced by Governor Ricketts and included in the recent budget passed by the Nebraska legislature. 
The Nebraska Career Scholarship Program will provide $2 million in scholarships to high achieving students in STEM and health care programs to students and is one example of a partnership we're pursuing to bolster graduates in high need areas. Further, we know the number of students graduating from Nebraska high schools as well as across the entire nation over the next 10 years will be stagnating. The university already enrolls a good number of Nebraskans. About 80% of all college-bound Nebraskans come to the University of Nebraska. The best way we can grow our population and workforce is through recruitment, and more importantly, retention of non-resident students. To do this, we will be announcing today the launch of a non-resident scholarship program. This will be focused individually on each campus. Each chancellor will be empowered to enact how they will attract out-of-state students. And as I think about this, if I was a student living in any state outside of Nebraska, and I was thinking about attending a non-state from my home state university and paying a tuition rate of $50,000, I want them to take a good look at Nebraska. You can come here under this scholarship program and attend one of our four campuses for less than one-fifth that cost. And we will provide you internships, a four-year graduation guarantee, reduced student debt, and a job here in the state of Nebraska. Finally, the value of education rests in the ability to obtain a good job upon graduation, have the skills to succeed, and the holistic ability to adapt through one's lifetime and career. With our close linkages to the business community and ability to be agile, we can create a nation-leading model in post-graduation success. A growing, thriving university depends on the voices, the ideas, and the success of all members of our community. We must be a university for everyone, a place where diverse backgrounds and ideas are welcomed and celebrated, where robust dialogue is encouraged, and where we are intentional and transparent in exploring how we can be a better place to learn, work, and study. And this is more than just a bunch of words. We have to have a bias for action in evaluating and improving our culture. That will include honest assessments of our success in areas for improvement, where there are gaps, like between UNL and UNMC faculty salaries and their peers, which have been a challenge for too long. We will put action plans in place to better support our talented faculty, staff, and students. I also want to give a special thanks to the Faculty Senate Presidents who came together as a group and brought forward a set of excellent action items for us in the diversity and inclusion space. We will be incorporating these ideas into our plan and I'm very appreciative of their work. Partners make the difference. We cannot be successful alone and we will invest our time in cultivating partnerships that will advance our work between campuses, with donors, and alumni. Elected leaders are higher educational partners and with all Nebraskans. I think that's your phone. <laughs> we also cannot be all things to all people. In pursuing excellence in outside the classroom, we will identify a select number of areas where we can be the world leader. We will have discipline in our investment and engagements focus on areas that matter to Nebraska and where we have deep expertise. As I said in our vision, these areas include water and food security, infectious disease, rural community vitality, national and cyber security, early childhood education. We are already very, very good at these areas, but we will become even better. The final section of our strategy centers on efficiency and effectiveness in planning and operations. Every major university in the country wants to be more efficient and effective. Nebraskans expect their university to operate with common sense and prudence. We won't spend money we, won't, we don't have. We will take care of the resources we do have, and we will continually look for opportunities to become leaner, more effective, and more efficient. Strategies in this area include launching a red tape review to combat bureaucracy. Are our policies fulfilling their purpose efficiently? Are there challenges for the employees and students to raise issues that are hindering our progress, our progress, sometimes unwittingly? A particular importance is developing a long-term plan to maintain our capital assets, including the buildings where we teach and conduct research, and the information technology infrastructure that supports virtually every aspect of our academic and business enterprises. 
Finally, we know sustainability is a high priority for our students and employees, and it is with me too. We will create a university-wide plan for improvement, preserving both university and natural resources. This is not an exhaustive list of our plans, but I hope this gives you a good sense of what we will try to accomplish in the years ahead. An important component of this will be metrics and public reporting. I plan to come back to you, the Board of Regents, on a regular basis to update you on our progress. To sum up, I'm confident about our future. I say that because this is a special quality about Nebraska that I've come to appreciate over the past seven months. There's a certain it factor that sets us apart from everyone else. We're tough, we work harder, we're loyal, we work smarter, we understand the value of getting things done. This moment in time is testing us, but I am convinced Nebraska is the best place to be. And last night we had a dinner. The governor of our great state, Pete Ricketts, was there, and he appointed me a Nebraska admiral. Now a lot of you know I'm a retired vice admiral serving proudly 38 years in our United States Navy. But I have to say, I didn't expect it. And uh, for many of you that are also Nebraska admirals, it's, a, it's an amazing program. It dates back to 1930. And we're the only state in the nation, just like our unit camera, we're unique in that regard. So I thought I would invoke a nautical theme as I wrap up maybe the fine point to this strategy. And it dates back to 1777, the father of our US Navy as we became a fledgling Navy was recruiting. He was recruiting young men to go to sea, to go into battle. Captain John Paul Jones said in this recruiting pitch, the stature of our homeland is no more than the measure of ourselves. The stature of our homeland is no more than the measure of ourselves. Those words probably resonate more true today than maybe they did in 1777. And in that pitch that he gave to young men to go to sea, to go to combat. And by the way, John Paul Jones never lost a battle at sea in his life, a Scottish immigrant who was remarkable and fearless in battle. And he said, sign on, come to the sea, come sail with me. And today, as the eighth president of the University of Nebraska, I would say to all Nebraskans and anyone across our great nation, come to Nebraska, sign on, come learn, Come grow, come work, and come win with us. Regent Pillen, that is my presentation of the five-year strategy. I stand by for comments and questions. Thank you, President Carter. Extraordinary work by you and your team. Um, Let's uh, start uh, with it being so student-focused. Let's start with our student regents. Um, Regent Miller. Thank you. Sorry, I just want to check my mic's still on. Um, I do uh, appreciate all the work that went into this and the diverse group of students, faculty, staff, and community members that helped you in guiding this. Um, I do have one question or maybe just want a little bit more elaboration on the note on the last talking about efficiency and effectiveness. Can you tell me more about the university-wide sustainability goals, um, what those will look like, who will help you decide them, um, and what you have as a vision for implementing those on all of our campuses? I, I think I heard uh, all of the points of your <laughs> question, uh, Regent Miller. Uh, if I understand your question, it's about the, <clears throat> our uh, desire to become um, more uh, economically uh, excuse me, uh, ergonomically as well as uh, energy efficient? So that, that's the question. Yes. So the strategy right now focuses on what we can do internally as a university first, looking at ourselves, zero emissions, reducing our own carbon footprint. Uh, there are other elements of what we do as a university that are tied to uh, some of our uh, investments in which we manage. We are going to be taking a close look at that as we go forward. So there'll be a lot more detail about that and how we uh, look at how we're going to be more energy efficient as a university, looking at ourselves first. Okay, thank you. Reg <coughs> Regent Beal. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I have no questions, but I'd like to thank you, President Carter, and the committee that, that put a lot of time into this. I think it goes a long ways to show uh, the prioritization of students. I'm reminded of the governor's remarks about growing Nebraska. 
And I, I'm appreciative that you realize that growing Nebraska starts with retur retur retaining and attracting talent into the state. And I think this, this strategy does, does just that. And so once again, thank you for your hard work on this initiative. Thank you, Regent Moore. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate this um, entire plan and um, the student-centeredness of it. Um, and I know we're giving access to a lot of students um, that probably wouldn't have access before. And so um, with that, um, what's um, the real plans for like retention? Um, are we um, putting a lot of effort into um, figuring out how we're going to make sure all students are successful um, and able to continue their programs and even go beyond um, a four-year degree and uh, advance to the master's program and things like that. I would like uh, to remind everybody that if you're comfortable, uh, we've checked with experts, everybody <coughs> would be, uh, com is comfortable that uh, uh, you can remove your mask as you speak if you so okay. in are inclined. Uh, Regent Schroeder. Hello. Um, thank you, President Carter. Um, I have no further questions, but that was an excellent presentation and thank you as well. I look forward to um, the next steps in the years ahead. Thank you, uh, Regional Connor. I just want to share that uh, I think one of the most impressive and critical parts of this plan is the focus on making education accessible and creating opportunities for young people. Um, I find a lot of hope in that, and it's um, challenging and sometimes a little bit scary to be a young person with student debt, wondering if you're going to be able to get through um, your university uh, program and start a career and be able to go through all the young um, parts of your life, like buying a house and starting a family. And I think that this should be a really hopeful sign um, for our young workforce that's uh, starting their lives. And I think that our uh, university and our state's focus on allowing young people to move forward is very, very impressive. And um, I applaud you and your transition committee because I think that this, this is an excellent five-year plan. So thank you for your hard work. <clears throat> Regent Weiss. I just want to say that I am this act yes, in the document. Really, I I, I know that you aren't going to let it become a dusty a dusty piece of paper on the on the shelf. So, the bias towards action, the excitement about bringing more people to Nebraska as well as to the university to nor to more Nebraskans, really is a wonderful wonderful plan. And the work that went into this is incredibly remarkable, especially in light of a period of pandemic in which it was created. So. Thank you very much for all the work. Thank you, Regent Weiss. Regent Hawks? Uh, I won't repeat some of the things that have been already said. I'll just say, I do that. This is a lot like Yogi Berra would say that if you don't know where you're going, you won't know if you got there. And I think that having this direction has been critical to us over the last several years. We've got a new place map for our direction. As President Carter said, we'll drill down and have measurements so we'll know what our progress is. But there are bold steps in here that are critical to our students, our university, and our state, especially driving toward the workforce and increasing our enrollment in ways where we can be helpful to those workforce needs. But this is a critical step forward, and it'll be great as it keeps getting implemented and retooled and retooled and retooled to stay up with where we need to go. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Hawks. <clears throat> uh, Regent Schaefer. Can you, President Carter, it's, it's a great plan. It's outstanding, uh, well written, and just did a, nailed it in your presentation. But can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on the implementation, execution, and then the the follow-up as far as tracking the data and the changes that you're hoping to accomplish. So this is a plan <clears throat> that 
paints a picture for things that we intend to do, a bias for action. And it speaks to five years, but I will tell you, it, it is designed to be well over the horizon for the next five, 10, and 20 years. For it to be effective, we have to create metrics by which we measure ourselves. So I will share with you, there will be a sister document to this five-year strategy that will get into the details, but it's also uh, underpinned through the individual strategies on each of our four main campuses. And that's been collaborated across all of our chancellors. And we will be creating a dashboard for metrics that will replace the one that you currently see. We will erase that starting today and create a new dashboard for how we will measure ourselves across all of these strategies. Uh, and we will have even more exacting numbers where we talk about growth and increase. We talk about 51,000 students today. I would tell you that uh, I'm, I'm comfortable articulating that we'll grow to 60,000 students, <coughs> maybe not by the five-year point, but by the 10-year point. We will start to track that. We'll start to look at our graduation rates. We'll start to look at uh, what our post-secondary rate education is across our entire state, which is part of that P16 initiative. And we'll look at the student success and how we grow our workforce. So this will be a heel-to-toe complete review of how we grow our state and how we make an impact on our nation. And we will use real metrics to measure ourselves. Thank you. <clears throat> Regent Ferris. Well, I've been looking forward to this since the uh, search committee had the discussions with Ted and one of his standout comments was his desire to put together this type of a document to launch his presidency here. Strategic plans sometimes are written just for the purpose of being able to say, we have one. And it never gets off the shelf after it's written. I think the thing that makes this different is that it is focused on action. Moving forward, getting it done. I think there's a relationship somewhere between you and Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> Get her done. And I think that's the goal in here, and that's one of the most exciting parts of this, is that there are practical ideas articulated here already for how we're going to start to launch it. And we'll look forward to those metrics that are coming. But Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Regent Clare. Thank you. Um, Ted, I, I really appreciate this uh, strategy uh, from a variety of different uh, points. And I'm going to start with the point of, of this state. I am, I am so proud and it's so awesome to hear you talk about, as Nebraskans, here's how we uh, live our lives. Here's how we adapt. Here's how we uh, put in an honest day's work. Uh, because we are a great state. We've got tremendous work ethic, tremendous ethics, tremendous integrity, honesty. Um, we're a great state. Then you combine that greatness with, with our K-12 system and your relationship with Matt uh, Bloomstead. And, and the K-12 system provides a tremendous education to, to young people. And then what happens is a lot of times those young people leave our state. So this, 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 these young people that have grown up with this high integrity, high work ethic, high character background leave our state to go to college and then they get a job out of state and so they end up staying out of state. So all that we've done is create these tremendous young people raise them with integrity and character and honesty and all the other values, and then they leave our state, and then in effect what they do is they make other states better. So I love the fact that what you're doing is saying, we're gonna keep, we're gonna aggressively pursue those people, those kids from in our state. We're also gonna offer, offer opportunities. I'm especially thankful for the, the, the out-of-state program as it relates to the legacy. A lot of my friends left our state because they couldn't find a job. So they've got a tie. They've got a grandparent that perhaps 
they're, you know, a parent that's, that's still here. So this legacy program enables us to attract those kids back. And then once we get them back, then we've got this great partnership with the state. We've got this great partnership with businesses. And that enables us to work with them, with, with those young people and, the, and, and our other partners to enhance their opportunity to, to transform their lives and, and offer them opportunities right here in this state. And why is that important? We have 60,000 jobs available right now in our state. And if you look at it closer, the estimates I think are, are even up closer to 80,000 because it's maybe not a vacancy of a job, but boy, it'd be nice to have that person in this job. And then the estimates are, if we don't do something in our state, there's another 17,000, I believe, that are retiring in the next 10 years just through normal attrition. So now you're close to 100,000 jobs. What would 100,000 families do in transforming our state? What would those do to the different communities throughout our state? And this, this strategy works hand in hand with what the governor and the legislature and all different communities are doing. And, and, and so I love the fact, and again, your, your, your naval background, I love all oars in the water at the same time, everybody pulling in the same direction. Thank you. So thank you very much for your work and for your partnership, uh, not only with, within our four campuses and five but with, with Curtis, but also with the state and with the, the private sector as well. Thank you, Regent Clare. Regent Kenny. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, President Carter, as I sit here and think about this, you know, I think it's a monumental uh, feat that you got it done. Uh, with everything that happened, you got it done. Uh, but what I reflect upon is, you know, many things will be constant through this and, and through time, but what if we'd hired you a year earlier? How much would this have changed uh, the way it was written about if you wrote a year ago? You know, things have become so dynamic now on, on how we deliver education, how we conduct business, how do we prepare for that? Things are gonna change. And I think this is gives us the ability to address that. And uh, that, that's kind of exciting that uh, we're way ahead of the curve, I believe, and uh, commend you and the committee for great work. Uh, you know, some of the things will be constant through education and things you have to improve on, but we have the ability now to look at the things that need to change and change fast. And uh, it starts here. Regent Kenny, I'd like to, uh, uh, first of all, just commend you for picking up on something that's so critical in the strategy, and it's the basic question. Did COVID-19 write the strategy, or did we write it before COVID-19? And, and the answer, and you bring up a great point, we wrote much of this strategy before the pandemic really struck home. And through the pandemic, through all the dynamics that we had to deal with, the change in modality of you know, dealing with a remote education, what COVID-19 did nothing more but validate the principles that are in this document. So to your point, if we had written this a year ago, I would tell you the principles would be all exactly the same. Some of the elements of delivery of education, which have to change and will change, uh, higher ed is realizing that now, uh, those are more at the operational, maybe the tactical level of how we bring education. But the values, the long-term thinking about how we're going to grow our state, grow our university, uh, are all there. Uh, and you know better than anybody at this table that this state operates by what happens in agriculture and farming and on our ranches. One in four dollars in the entire state. It is the principal engine that drives our state. But we're a partner in that. And how goes agriculture in the state? So goes the university. And that is completely in line with what we've written here. So thank you for bringing that up. It's a, it's a fantastic point. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Regent Kenny and President Carter. Um, I think uh, the last comment might be appropriate to say that uh, the great news about a strategy that the entire team, uh, when, when we talk about John Paul Jones and we talk about you saying, come to Nebraska, sign on, I think now, is the opportunity for all of us to sign on, roll our sleeves up, and make strategy happen. And uh, uh, the future is extraordinarily bright. Thank you very, very much. Uh, next for the meeting, we will move on to public comments. <clears throat>
The standing rules of the board provide that any person or persons may appear and address the Board of Regents on an item that are not on the agenda. If any individual provides the corporate secretary with 24 hours notice, in addition, anyone desires to speak on matters on the agenda at this meeting, regardless of notice, may do so. Each person or person so wishing to speak will be given up to five minutes to make remarks. Uh, public comment will be limited to a total of 30 minutes this morning. Uh, we've been contacted by two individuals who wish to speak on a topic not on the agenda. Uh, when your name is called, please come forward, identify yourself, uh, complete the sign-in sheet if you have not yet done so, and you'll have five minutes uh, to address the board. Uh, Stacia will hold a sign up when there's one minute left so that uh, you uh, have a rough idea of, of what your time uh, is. Uh, our first uh, public commenter is Shi uh, Yang, uh, has asked to speak on the topic of the Confucius Institute. Shi? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> We'll not sing she, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker. Ivy Harper has asked to speak on the creation of an NU Independent Citizen Oversight Board and an administrative salary, salaries. Ivy. Okay, don't see Ms. Harper. So uh, is there anyone else in the crowd who wants to address the board on a topic that is part of today's agenda? Okay, not seeing anyone, uh, I, uh, we will declare the uh, public comment period closed. <clears throat> um, I now declare the opportunity closed. On behalf of the board, I wish to thank uh, everybody uh, for being here. Um, it's now time to consider the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda on our board materials is ind indicated its name. It's moved and voted on as a group of action items as opposed to the administrative agenda where we have items considered and discussed individually. With that said, unless one of my colleagues on the board wishes to consider any of these items in the administrative agenda, I'd invite a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move, moved by uh, Regent Kenny, is there a second? Second. Second by Regent Ferries. Please call roll. Regent Moore. Yes. Regent Schroeder. Yes. Regent Beal. Yes. Regent Miller. Yes. Regent Kenny. Yes. Regent O'Connor. Yes. Regent Ferris. Yes. Regent Pillen. Yes. Regent Schaefer. Yes. Regent Whites. Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Hawks? No. Motion passes. Thank you. I would now ask President Carter to guide us through the administrative agenda. Thank you, Regent Pillen. Uh, the first item under academic affairs, item 9A1, seeks your approval to establish and approve the University of Nebraska Student Code of Conduct. Until now, each campus has been operating under its own separate student code of conduct. In today's environment, where students often take courses on multiple campuses, both online and in the classroom, it has become increasingly important to have a single, uniform code for students to rely upon, regardless of what campus or campuses they are attending. Our student affairs offices have been working together over the past year to produce a single code of conduct to serve the entire university system. Student and faculty leadership groups have been engaged in this process, and I think we have a good final product that cre creates greater consistency across our campuses. This proposal has been reviewed by the Academic Affairs Committee. I thank the university-wide team for their good work, and I recommend this item for your approval. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Regent Clare, second, second by Regent Schaefer. Motion on the floor, any comments? Uh, 
I would just like to say uh, that this process is now three years, maybe a little bit more so in the making. Um, and it's very exciting to have this code of conduct um, on our agenda to be approved. This process originated in ASUN leadership on UNL's campus um, with the student region that was serving at the time, Hunter Trainer, and has been passed along through previous student region, Emily Johnson, and now on to me. Um, and all previous and current administrations within ASUN support this code of conduct. Uh, there has been a lot of incorporated feedback from all stakeholders. Uh, and we think that this code um, can best serve students and especially in the mechanisms we put in place to have a, re um, a time to revisit that code periodically. So I encourage you all to support passing the student code of conduct. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Any other comments? <clears throat> Regent Schaefer. I believe this does an excellent job of setting the same standards and expectations across the university for our various campuses. It shouldn't matter and will not matter anymore whether and be treated differently if you're in Omaha versus Lincoln. And essentially, we'll treat all of our students the same. And that's the goal here is to treat uh, people that are similarly situated the same across the board. And I recommend and the Academic Affairs uh, Committee has vetted this process and recommends it for the board's approval. Thank you, Chairman Schaefer, and thanks to uh, everybody on the Academic Affairs Committee. There's lots of work and uh, everybody else that was involved in this process. Any other comments? Hearing none, please call roll. Regent Schroeder. Yes. Regent Beal. Yes. Regent Miller. Yes. Regent Moore. Yes. Regent O'Connor. Yes. Regent Ferris. Yes. Regent Pillen. Yes. Regent Schaefer. Yes. Regent Whites. Yes. Regent Clare. Yes. Regent Hawks. Yes. Regent Kenny. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 9A2 seeks your approval to amend Regents Policy 2.1.8 related to sexual misconduct and to repeal Regents Policy 5.3.3 .3, Procedures for Student Sexual Misconduct Complaints. As all of you know, in May, the U.S. Department of Education released new regulations on how colleges and universities covered by Title IX, including the University of Nebraska, must investigate and adjudicate reports of sexual misconduct. Institutions were told that we needed to have the new regulations in place by this day, August 14th. So we put together a university-wide committee to review our current policies and to make the necessary updates. The committee was made up of more than 30 students, faculty and staff from all four campuses to include our Title IX offices, student and academic affairs, human resources, and other stakeholder groups. The committee has worked under a rapid timeline to bring us into compliance. We appreciate, and I want to say personally, appreciate their good work. This is an area that we have to get right. We have a fundamental commitment to providing a safe and inclusive environment for all members of our university community to learn and work. As part of that commitment, we are continually working to prevent and address all forms of sexual misconduct and harassment on our campuses. Title IX officers are already working to educate their campus communities on the policy updates, and we will continue to evolve our practices to make sure that we get this right. These amendments have been reviewed by the Academic Affairs Committee, and I recommend their approval. Thank you, President Carter. Is there a motion? Moved by Regent Kenney. Second. Second. Second by Regent Schaefer. Comments? Regent Schaefer. Again, uh, and President Carter touched on this, and we addressed this in academic affairs, but there's probably not a more paramount responsibility to the university than when our citizens across the state and nation entrust us with their 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 students, uh, especially the, the these young women and men that come here to the university. The expectation is is that we're going to take care of them, uh, and that's at the forefront even be, before education comes, taking care of the the individual student. And I think this. Uh, 
goes a long ways toward uh, doing that. Uh, we're staying up to date with the current uh, Title IX changes, and I think uh, this is something that we need to be vigilant on. Uh, we've had some speakers here in the past, and in addressing this going forward, I think it's always something where we need to constantly be looking at ourselves as to how can we be better in this area. And so with that, I would recommend its approval. Thank you, Regent Schaefer. Please call roll. Regent Beal. Yes. Regent Miller. Yes. Regent Moore. Yes. Regent Schroeder. Yes. Regent Ferris. Yes. Regent Pillen. Yes. Regent Schaefer. Yes. Regent Whites. Yes. Regent Clare. Yes. Regent Hawks. No. Regent Kenny. Yes. Regent O'Connor. Yes. Motion passes. Item 9A3 seeks your approval for a revision to Regents policy with respect to non-resident tuition scholarships. Currently, in order for non-resident undergraduate freshmen to qualify for tuition, such scholarships, such students must, in addition to meeting all other admission requirements, one, be ranked in the upper 25% of their high school class or have scored a 23 or higher on the ACT or the SAT equivalent. Two emerging national trends make it necessary to revise this policy. First, many high schools are eliminating class rank. Second, due in large part to the pandemic, ACT and SAT tests taking has plummeted among high school students across the country. Therefore, it is recommended that Regents policy be revised to add a third option to achieve eligibility for such scholarships. That third option being a minimum cumulative high school grade point average GPA of a 3.0 or higher. This revision is recommended for approval by the Council of Chief Academic Officers and the Academic Affairs Committee. It has also been reviewed by the Executive Committee. I recommend this revision for your approval. Move Moved by Chairman Clare, seconded by, or by Regent Clare, and seconded by uh, uh, Regent Kenny. Comments or questions? <clears throat> Regent Beal. I believe this is a great change. I think GPAs are powerful reflections of students' dedication, as well as a gauge of their work ethic. Uh, despite COVID's disruption of standardized testing across the country, I think this will put us in a strong position to continually recruit and better accommodate high quality students and bring them into the state of Nebraska. Thank you, Regent Beal. Regent Clare. I would second those comments and then also would add that, that um, once we get that student in the, in the state into our system, it's incumbent upon the partnership that we have, again, with the state and with the private sector to work hard and get those <coughs> students internship opportunities and exposure to our, our workforce uh, and work to retain them in our state. And uh, a lot of these students, and again, I spoke about this earlier with the legacy program, I think the, this will be a great, a great tool to attract some of those Nebraskans who for employment purposes left our state to bring them back. I mean, if you look 100 years ago, our population was 1.25 million. Today, it's 1.9 million. So 100 years, we've grown very few people. This is going to help change that trajectory, and it's going to be transformational for families. You know, I, I've got five kids, <coughs> and four of them live here in this state, and it's, it's really awesome to have your, your students here. So I'm all in favor of this. Thank you. Chairman. <coughs> Regent Schroeder. This just gives us another opportunity and a tool available in how we bring in students into the University of Nebraska. And as the president mentioned, with COVID, uh, a huge drop in the number of ACT and SAT test takers. And as also as the president mentioned, uh, some schools just won't release the class rankings. So uh, we vetted this, uh, again, through academic affairs. In fact, it wasn't on our initial meeting. And so we convened a special uh, single-purpose academic affairs committee meeting just to, to vet this process and thought it was going to take maybe uh, 15 minutes, but we spent uh, a good half hour just talking about this and had good discussion. And uh, with that, uh, it comes to the full board with the academic affairs uh, recommendation for approval. Thank you, Regent Schaefer. Regent Schroeder. 
I would also just like to underscore that a lot of these standardized tests tend to serve as barriers for low-income students and minority students. So I think this is a further great recommendation in terms of working towards building a more inclusive and a more diverse um, workforce and student body here in the state of Nebraska. So with that, I would also suggest and recommend the approval of this. Thank you, Regent Schroeder. Any other comments? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Regent Hawks, did you have a comment? Yes. I think as we implement this, we should track which kids come in under 3.0 separately so that we know our success with that. And why I bring that up is our foundation, we have a 2.8 criterion, and their students have done nearly 100% success with a lower grade requirement. And that especially fits with the comments made about particularly low income, a minority uh, trying to acclimate to our country and its traditions. And we've found that to be very beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Hawks. Regent Weiss, did you have a comment? No. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, I'd, I'd just like to give a great thank you to the Council of all the Chief Academic Officers and Academic Affairs Committee for uh, extra work and making this happen quickly. Uh, please call the roll. Regent Miller. Yes. Regent Moore. Yes. Regent Schroeder. Yes. Regent Beal. Yes. Regent Pillen. Yes. Regent Schaefer. Yes. Regent Weitz. Yes. Regent Clare. Yes. Regent Hawks. No. Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. The motion passes. Item 9A4 <coughs> seeks your approval for the discontinuance of the Master of Arts in Health and Kinesiology in the School of Health and Kinesiology in the College of Education, Health, and Human Sciences at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. The school currently offers both an MS and an MA in Health and Kinesiology. The only difference between these degrees is that the Master of Science students complete six credits of thesis and thesis defense, while the Master of Arts students complete six credits of additional elective courses and comprehensive exams. The Master's of Science degree reflects the science focus of the program, and both thesis and non-thesis options will be offered in the Master of Science degree. Students that entered into the Master of Arts degree will be allowed to continue progress in that degree or change into the Master of Science degree. This proposal has been reviewed by the Council of Academic Officers <coughs> and recommended for approval by the Academic Affairs Committee. I recommend it for the board's approval. Any comments? Regent Schaefer. Chancellor Gold, would you have a comment? What we will do is create two optional tracks within the Master of Science uh, degree to accommodate the different group of students' needs. So I recommend approval. Thank you. Seeing none other, please call roll. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we need a motion and a second, please. Moved by Regent Kenny, seconded second. by Regent Moore. Please call roll. Regent Moore? Yes. Regent Schroeder? Yes. Regent Beal? Yes. Regent Miller? <coughs> yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Weitz? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Hawks? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. The motion passes. Item 9A5 seeks your approval to create a real estate undergraduate certificate by the Department of Finance, Banking, and Real Estate in the College of Business Administration at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. The proposed 15 credit hour certificate will provide a comprehensive foundation of key real estate concepts and is structured so that students that complete the certificate may sit for the Nebraska real estate exam. 
This proposed certificate has been reviewed by the Council of Academic Officers and recommended for approval by the Academic Affairs Committee. I recommend it for the board's approval. So moved. Moved by, <coughs> moved by Regent uh, Claire, second by Regent Moore. <coughs> Comments? Uh, Regent Kenny. I have a question. Uh, Senator Gold, will this allow uh, people from across the state to work on their their uh, real estate uh, certificates or add to it or? Yes, sir. Uh, so the College of Business has offered uh, this curriculum for a long period of time, <clears throat> several decades. But this will formally make it a Board of Regents approved certificate, uh, which is a credential that will be useful to those that complete it. Uh, and yes, it will be, of course, available uh, statewide. Thank you. And in every other state, for that matter. Regent Moore. Jim? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say this is really an exciting and great opportunity. Um, I know it's um, existed, and I think a lot of students um, weren't aware of it, but I think it just opens up a lot of doors for um, the non-degree seeking students and non-traditional students to have an opportunity to um, explore real estate and um, um, get a certificate uh, without, you know, seeking a degree. So I think it's really a great opportunity. Thank you. Regent Schaefer. Really one of the better value adds that we can provide here at the university, especially through the various business colleges. And I would encourage uh, that this be something that we explore across all campuses. Uh, as someone who, as a young graduate of the University of Nebraska, I wanted and had obtained a real estate uh, license early in my career and had to go and, and take some additional classes outside of the university in order to sit and take and pass that exam. But I think this is just something that's real practical. It's not going to cost the university any more money, but it's really going to save uh, students and and folks that want to go into real estate uh, save them a lot of time and money and effort. So I really, this is a great add-on, and again, providing value to our students. So uh, recommend it for approval. Thank you, Regent Schaefer. Please call roll. Regent Schroeder. Yes. Regent Beal. Yes. Regent Miller. Yes. Regent Moore. Yes. Regent White. Yes. Regent Clare. Yes. Regent Hawks? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. This concludes the academic affairs portion of our agenda. I would like to take a minute uh, to uh, thank uh, Regent Schaefer, Chair of Academic Affairs, uh, Regent Ferries. Regent O'Connor, Regent Whites, and Regent Moore for, for all your work. Uh, lots and lots of work goes on behind the scenes in our committee, and uh, uh, this, was, uh, this was exceptional. Greatly appreciated by all. President Carter. <clears throat> we'll now move into business affairs. Mr. Chairman, with your approval, I would ask that items 9B1 and 9B2, approval of the fiscal year 2021 2022 and fiscal year 2022-2023 operating biennial request for the university and Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture be considered together. As we discussed in our June meeting, COVID-19 has created fiscal challenges. Enrollment unpredictability and other uncertainties for colleges and universities around the country. The university's biennial operating budget request is a continuation of the three-year plan discussed in June to address these challenges, but also position ourselves to emerge in a position of strength for future growth and success. The proposed request prioritizes affordability and access for Nebraska students, limits spending growth to basic operations, and creates long-term opportunities to invest in campus and system-wide priorities like student success, faculty salaries, diversity and inclusion, and facility maintenance. Key elements of the request, the consensus result of months of work by university leadership include a requested 2% annual increase in state support in the next biennium 
plus increases for the Nebraska Career Scholarships and state-imposed expense increases. This modest increase reflects the university's commitment to being a good partner to the governor, Appropriations Committee Chairman John Stinner, and the legislature as they work through fiscal challenges at the state level. As we outlined in June, $43 million in permanent state-aided spending cuts across the system over the next three fiscal years. My office will lead this effort with the university's central administration office taking a 10% budget cut while each chancellor is currently leading their campus-specific budget reduction processes. A two-year across-the-board tuition freeze in the 2022 and 2023 academic years, and fully funding Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture's operating needs given its strategic importance to Nebraska's <laughs> agriculture economy. The biennial request is required to be submitted to the Coordinating Commission for Post-Secondary Education, CCPE, by August 15, 2020, and the governor and the legislature by September 15, 2020. This request was reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for your approval. Is there a so motion? In, so moved by Regent Ferry, second by Regent Schroeder. Comments? Mr. Chairman? <clears throat> uh, Regent Hawks. Uh, I think that this is a really good budget, and the point I wanted to make is we feel when we have a budget approved and we have the legislature behind us on one hand, that we've accomplished something. The real accomplishment will be by the administration, the faculty, and the students, and the staff implementing this budget, which is extremely difficult. So the hand on the tail there is really critical on how this goes forward. Thank you, Regent Hawks. Other comments? Regent Ferries? Well, we've had a lot of discussions about the budget and the whole process as we've worked our way through it, and this is just the formalization of it. Uh, we would have done it earlier, but things just did not lend itself to a meeting ahead of today. But I'm, I'm convinced that all of the things that we've talked about before uh, are here, and I'm very comfortable with the budget and the business and finance committee was, comes with our approval. Thank you, Regent Ferris. Please call roll. Regent Beal. Yes. Regent Miller. Yes. Regent Moore. Yes. Regent Schroeder. Yes. Regent Clare. Yes. Regent Hawks. Yes. Regent Kenny. Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Weitz? Yes. The motion passes. Item 9B3 seeks your approval of the university's fiscal year 2021-22 and fiscal year 2022-23 biennial capital budget request. As I indicated in my five-year strategic plan remarks, we have ambitious goals for academic excellence and enrollment growth to meet the needs of Nebraska's economy. And if we are to be successful, we need to have facilities that are suited to 21st century learning and research. The upkeep of university facilities, which are valued at over $5 billion, is critical to the university's ability to recruit and retain top talent in today's competitive marketplace. And as budgets tighten, a proactive approach to facility maintenance is more important than ever. The costs for emergency repairs are significantly more than regular maintenance. And I know the board has been concerned with this issue for some time, well before my arrival. Therefore, as part of my five-year strategic plan, I am announcing the launch of the 2021 University Facilities Plan. This will be a long-term capital renewal and repair plan that we believe is pragmatic and sustainable. To make the plan most effective, we will need to continue the long-term successful partnership between the university and the state of Nebraska. As our buildings are ultimately assets of the state, NU buildings represent about 70% of the state's total building asset portfolio. Key elements of the facilities plans include, first, your approval of the proposed 2021-23 biennial capital request which would ask the governor and the legislature to provide $2 million of funding in fiscal year 2021 and 22, and an additional $4 million in fiscal year 22 23 
for deferred maintenance projects. I and the chancellors have already committed to matching these amounts one for one with dollars from the university operating budget. And our facility teams are finalizing a list of projects that would be undertaken with these funds. This includes everything from roof replacements, concrete repairs, electrical upgrades, and fire and life safety enhancements. Second, we intend to have discussions with the governor, Senator Stinner, and other policymakers about the potential of extending the existing $11 million annual capital appropriation through 2050 so the long-term renewal plans can be developed. The $11 million would be continued to be matched by $11 million of university funding. And finally, we intend to explore the feasibility of establishing a depreciation fund on new buildings being constructed beginning in fiscal years 24-25. Continu continuing the partnership with the state theme, our proposal would be to fund the depreciation fund equally between the university and the state. These relatively modest and pragmatic annual investments result in a big time impact, a $2 billion capital plan that is predictable and sustainable. Details are included in your agenda materials. With this plan, I believe the university would be on the forefront of addressing the deferred maintenance problem that plagues almost every university across the country. As I said in my remarks, we will have a bias to action in executing our strategic plan. And I think this plan demonstrates our commitment to get things done. I'm proud of the collaboration and leadership our chancellors and chief business officers have demonstrated in putting this proposal together. The proposal has been reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for your approval. Motion. <clears throat> Regent Kenney. Second. Second by Regent Schroeder. Comments? Mr. Regent Beal. Uh, as we saw a few years ago with the bursting of a water line in one of UNK's uh, campus Greek housing facilities, um, I want to say that I realize how critical it is that we not defer maintenance on buildings uh, across our campuses. I appreciate this is thoughtful, um, and I, I couldn't support the initiative more. Thank you, Regent Beal. Other comments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Regent, Regent Hawks. And if you could speak up just a hair more in there, we could maybe hear you just a little clearer, Regent Hawks. Thank you. With my control, maybe I'll take this thing and hang it right here. Okay. Does that work better? Go ahead. Thank you. Right. How's this work? There you go. Oh, That's good. Much better. Off my jacket. Um, I think this is a good plan, better than we've historically done, but we should not pat ourselves on our back. We're falling farther behind and where we're being maybe a little more aggressive than other institutions, that's not particularly helpful in light of the problems they have. But if we look at the $5 billion value, an appropriate amount of maintenance and depreciation would be at least 2%. Could be as high as three or four, but 2%. And if at 2% on the $5 billion, we'd have $100 million a year going, to, going toward deferred maintenance. The real problem is we can't get enough money currently to do this. But this should always be in our targets as we're insufficient. We're doing as good as we can, but we have an insufficient plan. And we should not complement ourselves uh, with the plan that we have because it needs to be better. And I think President Carter has seen that already. Thank you. Thanks, Regent Hawks. Regent Hawks' points are really, really important <clears throat> because we have fallen behind and uh, the old cliche of kicking the can down the road with our money of our facilities, so a lot of work. And I might add that uh, Regent Hawks brings a great point about uh, getting too excited, slapping our bat hand on our back. If anybody uh, wants to start getting a long arm and reach around, flap, slap in the back. Uh, Ted, your strategic plan does not allow time for that, so that's yeah. pretty exciting. Other comments? <laughs> Regent Ferris, <laughs> Chair of Business and Finance. Well, I think we just, I would echo what Howard just uh, just said and what Ted said in his presentation. It's a, again, it's another one of those projects that you think you need to approach it, but we just haven't gotten it done. And so this, uh, and, and don't, 
believe that this is going to solve all the problems, but it gets us moving in the right direction at a good time, and we can form a good partnership with the state here, and I think uh, we can get at it. So uh, it comes with uh, the recommendation of business and finance that we uh, approve the project. Thank you, Regent Ferries. Please call roll. Regent Miller. Yes. Regent Moore. Yes. Regent Schroeder. Yes. Regent Beal. Yes. Regent Hawks. Yes. Regent Kenny. Yes. Regent O'Connor. Yes. Regent Ferris. Yes. Regent Pilland. Yes. Regent Schaefer. Yes. Regent Whites. Yes. Regent Clare. Yes. The motion passes. Item 9B4, seek your approval for the university's Information Technology Services Unit to borrow up to $16.5 million from the university's internal loan program to purchase IT infrastructure equipment. As many of you may think immediately, as I said in the strategy, we would not spend money that we don't have. So when we come to the regions to talk about borrowing money, it's not to just borrow money. It's an investment for the future that has to have return on investment. In February, the Board of Regents approved an agreement with Data Division LLC and Gov Connections Incorporated to provide equipment and related services for campus backbone and data center network solutions. As indicated in February, these agreements will realize savings estimated to exceed $15 million. The university has negotiated additional savings by purchasing the equipment up front. Over $6 million in additional savings and professional services will be provided to the university including implementation support, dedicated on-site engineers, and staff training. To take advantage of this opportunity, the university's Information Technology Services ITS team intends to borrow up to $16.5 million from the university's internal lending program to fund the equipment purchases. This is another great example of savings and efficiencies achieved by our new debt strategy, and kudos to the board and the business and finance team for establishing the internal lending program last year. The proposal, the proposal was reviewed by the Executive Committee and the Board of Regents, and I recommend it to you for your approval. So Motion moved, moved so by moved. Regent Kinney, second by Regent, I'm sorry, Regent Ferry, second by Regent uh, Beal. Comments? Mr. Chairman. Regent Mr. Chairman. Hawks. Uh, this is a great project. I have a couple comments I would like to make. I made them in committee. I think we need to analyze. Howard, if you could hold your mic up closer, it would really be helpful. Thank you. Okay. It should be as good as I can get unless I swallow it. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I think we should analyze doing the other half at the same time. There's usually a lot of synergies of doing that. Uh, instead of waiting to do a half, maybe, maybe all of it is too big a bite to try. Uh, and Mr. Kaborik knows this, but I think the rate we're charging this project is too high, and we ought to have a flexible rate, which I know he's going to look at. But anyway, this is a good project. It's critical for us. And I'm glad it's moving forward, and I hope we look at the other half. Thank you, Howard. Any other comments? I would just remind my colleagues that uh, this internal lending program is a, um, I give credit to Chris Kaborik as it, uh, being part of uh, his suggestion to us that we consider this in connection with some of the refinancing that we did on some of the bonds that were there. And uh, I think it has made good sense for us to have this. Um, it's no different than having invested the money somewhere else. We're getting a rate of return on it when it's not needed. When it is needed, we're charging an interest rate. But it's a, it's a much smoother and easier process, and it keeps those funds available. Uh, so again, it's, we're not doing some things that we can't afford or don't have the money for. Uh, we just have them in a more functional and efficient position by having the internal lending program. So uh, business and finance was in favor of getting that program established in the first place and certainly uh, recommending the approval of this. This comes to the board because of the amount that's here. It has to have board approval. Thank you, Regent Ferries. 
Please call roll. Regent Moore. Yes. Regent Schroeder. Yes. Regent Beal. Yes. Regent Miller. Yes. Regent Kenny. Yes. Regent O'Connor. Yes. Regent Ferris. Yes. Regent Pillen. Yes. Regent Schaefer. Yes. Regent Whites. Yes. Regent Clare. Yes. Regent Hawks. Yes. The motion passes. Item 9B5 seeks your approval to increase the budget on Whitson Hall renovation and Wigton Heritage Center project at UNMC. Through the generosity of the private community, a $748,000 increase is proposed to expand on the previous support of digital exhibit space. These exhibits will share UNMC's story and history through the McGugan Library's vast special collections, artifacts, and rare books. This is an entirely privately funded item, and we can't thank the donors enough for their ongoing public-private partnerships that enhance our university. The budget increase has been reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for approval. Motion, please. Moved by Regent Clare, seconded by Regent Ferries. Regent Ferries, would you just uh, mind uh, reminding the board on why this is before us as far as the process of a project once a program statement? Well, once we have a, a request to make a change, uh, if the amount of the change is sufficient, then it has to be reviewed by business affairs, which it has been done, and then it needs to come to the board. And uh, it's, you know, it's in that no-brainer category because we're, we're funded entirely here by private funds. And uh, I, the chancellor has promised us that um, we're going to get this project totally done. You've been hearing about it uh, in various pieces since 2017. And uh, so it's, it's probably about time that we wrap it up. But uh, every one of the things that have happened along the way have been positive and have added to the project. And we're grateful to the private uh, sector for funding it. Thank you, Regent Ferris. Any other comments? Chancellor. Chancellor Gold, thank you. Well, Regent Ferris, I'm really pleased to tell you that the uh, McGugan Library is going to open on Tuesday uh, <laughs> of next week. But I would just point out to the regents and to the others that this started out as an $18 million state-funded project. And by the time we are finished, we will probably have raised close to another $18 million in private money to enhance this project. It's yet another amazing example of a public-private partnership uh, through the University of Nebraska. And it, we're very proud of this project. But uh, thank you for egging us on. Well said. Thank you, Chancellor Gold. Seeing no other comments, please call roll. Regent Schroeder. Yes. Regent Beal. Yes. Regent Miller. Yes. Regent Moore. Yes. Regent O'Connor. Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Whites? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Hawks? I think we should approve this if Jeff already spent the money. Yes. <laughs> Regent Kenny? Yes. The motion passes. Item 9B6 seeks your approval for various change orders on the Monroe Meyer Institute MMI renovation project. To be clear, these change orders have no impact on the project's overall budget. We are simply moving funds from the contingency account to the construction account. The overall project remains within budget. However, board policy requires change orders that exceed 1.25% or $1 million be approved by the board. Chancellor Gold and I look forward to the opening of this world-class facility so that MMI can continue to provide wonderful service to all Nebraska. The change orders were reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend them to you for approval. <clears throat> Motion. Moved by Regent Kenney. Is there a second by Regent Ferries? Comments? Hearing none, please call roll. Regent Beal. Yes. Regent Miller? Yes. Regent Moore? Yes. Regent Schroeder? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Whites? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Hawks? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. The motion passes. 
The last item up for vote is item 9B7, seeks your approval to dispose of UNMC property located at uh, 521 South 38th Avenue in Omaha. And as we went through the five-year strategy this morning, and I didn't cover every single detail that is in the document, one of the key elements in our efficiencies is looking for opportunities to monetize land that we do not use and capabilities that we as a university do not use. And this fits right in that category. Acquired by the Board of Regents in 2009, this property was previously utilized as office and meeting space. However, after, after an assessment by UNMC, this property has been deemed excess in regards to UNMC programming needs. The cost of upkeep and maintenance on this property continues to increase. Therefore, UNMC has determined that selling the property is the best course of action at this time. UNMC intends to use a real estate broker to help execute the transaction. This item was reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for your approval. Motion, please. Motion, please. Moved by Regent Kinney, seconded by Regent Schroeder. Comments? Seeing none, please call roll. Regent Miller? Yes. Regent Moore? Yes. Regent Schroeder? Yes. Regent Beal? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Weitz? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Hawks? Yes, and Jim, I'd like to speak a minute after this vote before you close on. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. This concludes the business affairs portion of our meeting and would certainly like to uh, thank Chairman Ferries of Business Affairs Committee, uh, Regent Miller, uh, Regent Hawks, and uh, Regent Kenny for all their work. And Regent Hawks, uh, please. I know we do kudos at the beginning, but on behalf of Barbara Weitz and myself, I want to give kudos to the UNO team for making this really work for us. We've got a lot of black boxes, and they've been in here working hard, adjusting mine because you're having difficulty with it. But anyway, they've really been attentive. It's been very professional and extremely helpful. And we both want to thank them, if I can speak for Barbara. Yes. Howard, you can speak for me. But I'm also very grateful. And, um, it's been amazing. Thank you. And there should be no reason why we uh, can't continue to operate this way if uh, that is everybody's pleasure. President Carter. Uh, under the for information only, there are five items related to the strategic framework and the dashboard indicators. Obviously, those dashboard indicators will be looking for change metrics as we implement the five-year strategy. There are also numerous reports for your review. On behalf of the board, accept those reports. Thank you, President Carter. There being no further business, if there's no objections, uh, this meeting will stand adjourned. Thank you all for everybody being here and all your work. Thank you.